I think one of the most important things that I learned is that perfect is the enemy of good. And we have to forgive ourselves. We have to let ourselves off the hook. And we have to realize that getting 70 or 80 percent of the way there is often good enough. Congratulate yourself. Move on to the next thing. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Dr. Jordan Grummet, who's going to share how to live. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and create harmony to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. I want to share an old proverb I always heard growing up. Time and tide wait for no man. Let's face it, life goes on no matter what. The universe is not waiting for you. So what are you waiting for? That's our subject for today. Living while we can. How do you live life on purpose? If you died tomorrow, would you have regrets? I know you may think this is a depressing topic. It's not. It's designed to bring you to life and allow you to live life full out. Being intentional and doing what you love instead of grinding towards some future when you think you'll be happy. Listen in to some of the stories from Dr. Grummet. And if you want to hear the backstory, check out his previous episode when he joined us. Number 108, Life, Death, Health, Wealth, and Wisdom. Doc G is back today to talk about his new book. He was originally born in Evanston, Illinois, and his interest in becoming a doctor was ignited when his father and an oncologist died unexpectedly in the prime of his life. That profound loss not only inspired him to practice medicine, it gave him a unique perspective as a financial expert, challenging him to think deeply and critically about concepts like wealth, abundance, and financial independence. After graduating from the University of Michigan, he got his medical degree from Northwestern and began practicing internal medicine. He's currently an associate medical director at Journey Care Hospice. After years of blogging about financial independence and wellness, he launched his own podcast, Earn and Invest, in 2018, which received the Best New Personal Finance Award from the Plutus Awards in 2019. And he's been nominated for Best Personal Finance Podcast of the Year in 2020 and 2021. Let's meet my friend, Doc G. Welcome back to Richer Soul, Jordan Grummet. It's great to have you join us today. I'm so happy to be here and happy to talk to you. And I'm excited to learn from you. So we're back to talk about your book, Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. What inspired you to write the book? So I feel like I've lived two separate lives. One of these lives started when I was seven years old and my father was a somewhat prominent doctor and oncologist, which is a cancer doctor, and he died suddenly. And I was right at that age where I idolized him and I wanted to be just like him. So I decided that I'm going to be a doctor. And really, 
my identity got wrapped up in that idea for the next 20 years of my life. I went to high school and college. I got into medical school. I started residency. And somewhere back in the, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I'm going to fulfill that space my father left when he died. And so that was the pers- first part of my life. And as I started to practice medicine, I realized that all those things I thought medicine would be, it wasn't. It wasn't rushing in the room and saving people's lives. A lot of it was the slow and difficult work of dealing with human beings, with dealing with complex systems, with dealing with administration and the government and insurance companies. And I found myself not enjoying it as much as I thought I would. And it caused a little bit of a crisis in my life because I realized I was burning out and I just couldn't see myself going full force the way I had in my medical career for the next 20 or 30 years. And that's when I found personal finance and financial independence. A guy named Jim Dolly, the white coat investor, sent me a book to review for my medical blog at the time. I was writing a medical blog and I read his book and it taught me what financial independence is. And I realized immediately that I was financially independent, but I had no idea who I wanted to be. I was going to let go of that identity of being a physician because it no longer fit real well, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. That started the next few years of exploration where I became a personal finance blogger, eventually a podcaster, a public speaker. So I realized I had these two disparate lives, this life and identity as a doctor, and then this life and identity as a personal finance person. I had pretty much left almost all of medicine. The only thing I clung to was to work in hospice, which is end of life care for people. It's helping make people comfortable so they can die peacefully. I had been doing that for the last few years, and it really struck me the dying have a lot to teach the living about what's important in life. And so on one hand, I'm dealing with all these people who are trying to figure out their finances, trying to build their net worth, trying to become financially independent. But I felt like there was a part of that education that was missing, and I was getting it from my dying patients who were being told that they had six months or less to live and all of a sudden had to decide what is important in life. What is important in life? What do I want to do with whatever time I have left? What wrongs do I need to write? What goals have I met? What goals haven't I met? And I just started thinking, how powerful would that be if we could start having these realizations way before we were on our deathbeds? And not only that, but start using all this wonderful financial power that we had learned to get there faster and start doing those things that were really important to us. And then the other side of that was learning how not to let money and finances cloud us from what was really important. James has done an amazing job. I mean, he's also a physician and he's built his financial blogging and empire, we'll call it, because he makes a lot more money financial blogging than he does being a doctor. But he still practices, I believe, right? He still has his hands in the business. He's an ER doc. So it's a little bit different. You're in, you're on, and when you're done, you leave. You don't have to fuss. And I will say I've been around medicine for the majority of my working career when I was employed, and it has changed. So burnout is, I'm going to say it's a new thing in a sense. And I think in the past, residency was always burnout. But once you got through residency, Wednesdays was golf day. (laughs) <laughs> right. That's yeah. the doctor's offices were all closed on Wednesday because it was golf day. And that changed at some point. And the economics of medicine have changed. And the freedom of medicine has changed. In the past, doctors worked for themselves, they had autonomy. Today, more and more doctors work in a system for MBAs, of which I'm one. And I can tell you, it, it isn't pretty anymore. And it's one of the many major problems we have in medicine, unfortunately. Um, And I don't think most people outside of the industry have any idea what's going on inside the industry. I think the doctors of old had a few things going for them. One is they had autonomy. Pretty much no one told them how to practice. Two, they had really high salaries and a good income, right? So they figured, I'm going to give my life to this profession, but at least I'm going to have enough money to live comfortably. And lastly, they had the respect of society. Like 
you know, you were a doctor, you were highly respected. I think the doctors of the last decade or two have really felt that all of those have changed. <laughs> so the autonomy is not there anymore. The pay is not nearly as good. And the respect of society has waned. And I think that's been really difficult and has caused a lot of burnout. And again, you know, there's no question about it. Being a doctor, it's a lot of hard work. And I think it felt better when you felt like you were getting kind of that respect and all those benefits. And I think nowadays you get all the hard work, but it doesn't feel as much of a, as a wonderful job than it, that it used to. No. And unfortunately it's a, it's a long track to get there, right? So you go to college, then you go to medical school, then you do your residency, then you do your fellowship. And now you might be early thirties by the time you're ready to launch. So you're significantly behind everyone else. And I'm not going to say you struggle throughout that whole period, but you're not making a ton of money and you're putting everything in life on hold before that gets started. And it's hard to change your trajectory when you walk out the door and go, well, maybe this isn't what I wanted, but yet you did it. Yeah. I mean, it's all about deferred gratification, right? And the problem with deferred gratification is often you don't know what it's going to feel like when you get there. And especially when you're becoming something, and I think this is not just being a doctor, but a lawyer, an accountant, or, or anything that really is a big audacious goal is you only have a glorified dream of what it's going to be until you arrive. And sometimes when you get there, you realize it's not exactly what you thought it would be. No, it's not. And I just think it's a lot harder to climb another mountain when you're a doctor. Well, attorneys do it all the time. Like attorneys, half of all attorneys don't even practice law. You don't see half of all doctors not practicing medicine. It, because you've made such an investment, it becomes really hard to walk off that ladder. And I will tell you, because I called on a lot of fellows and they're like, if we knew then what we know now, they probably would have picked a different path, but they're stuck on it, unfortunately. But you always get the choice to make a change. And it's up to you to do that. And I think that's a really important point. Um, you've got to kind of figure out who you are and what you want. And I think we make the mistake of trying to figure out our finances first very often. And we forget to actually think about what is our purpose? What, are, what is our identity? What's the most important connections in our life? And we leave that all until after we get to a certain net worth number. And one of the things I really try to promote in the book is Actually, I think we need to start thinking about those things first and then build our financial structure and foundation around that, as opposed to it being an afterthought. People are putting the cart before the horse. And it has consequences because then a lot of times we do get to the, our financial goals and we have no idea who we are, or what we want, which actually can lead to depression, which did with me. I mean, I got incredibly anxious when I realized I was financially independent because I was faced with this idea of letting go of the identity of being a physician, the identity of being close to my father who had died when I was young. Um, and I had no idea who I wanted to be or what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. And there's some stories in the book, too, about people who kind of got to that same place where they thought financial independence was going to make them jubilant. But instead, it caused a crisis in their lives. Money doesn't solve problems and it amplifies who you are. So. If you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy then. So, And there's a comment, I think, that was in the book that you said that kind of touches on this. You mentioned that nearing death, money and work crumble. What did you mean by that? So it's almost like you have a blindfold on, right? And let's call that blindfold money or even career in a sense. And we wear that blindfold most of our lives. And in some ways, I think it's because it's easy, right? Because you can look, for instance, at money and you can say, here are my goals and I'll either get there or I won't. But if I don't get there, then there's some things I can do, right? I can work harder. I can save more. I can start side hustles. In a sense, it's low hanging fruit. What happens when people get a death sentence, when they become terminally ill is you no longer can wear that blindfold. Life all of a sudden is being presented to you as it is. And you don't have time to put off the important work anymore. So I think a lot of us put off that important work of trying to figure out who we are and what we want, because it's really scary, hard work. And in a sense, I think it also reminds us that death is always around the corner. Like our lives are finite. It's much easier to focus on a goal such as money or net worth 
or something else that's kind of easy to put out there, it's much harder to say, you know what, my time on this earth is finite. I only have enough time to accomplish that, which, which is really important to me. I better start thinking about it now. And so people don't like to do that. So they put it off. Why do people have anxiety and fear over figuring out who they are and what they want? I think it's incredibly hard work. And I think it also reminds us of our mortality, right? Because at some point, think about the idea of a bucket list, right? People talk about bucket lists all the time. And what do we think about in our minds? We think about some old retired person who starts thinking about the fact that they're going to die and better get everything in. It's kind of a scary thought. It reminds us of our mortality. And so it's, again, it's much easier to push off the really hard work than to sit there and say, oh my God, I don't know when my end's going to be. It could be tomorrow. It could be a week. It could be a year. It could be 10 or 20 years. I don't know, but I better start thinking about the hard stuff now. I think it's much easier to just say, eh, I'll concentrate on something easier for now. Maybe the final class in college should be create your bucket list. You know, I think it should be. One of the things I talk about in the book quite a bit is people in hospice do something called a life review, right? So they sit down with a nurse or a social worker or a chaplain or a doctor. And with some kind of probing questions, we get our patients to talk about their lives, to review it. What did they accomplish? What didn't they accomplish? What were their hopes? What were the dreams? What were the key relationships in their lives? What were the things they wished they had been able to do, but they failed? What were the things they wished they'd been able to do, but they never tried? The reason why is we're looking to help people get to a sense of peace and closure in their life. Why don't we do that every year? Why don't we do that when we graduate college? Why don't we do that every time we start a new job? Why don't we continually question these things and start working on them now? I mean, my dad died when he was 40 years old. He didn't get the chance to live to 50 or 60 or 70. He didn't have the option to put it off till later. The future is not guaranteed. So why don't we think about those things now? And better yet, we're going to be spending the next, let's say you are coming out of college, right? You could be spending the next 60 years living life. Why not put the work we do, especially the work we do making money, why not put that in the perspective of being the kind of people we want to be? Because otherwise, you go to work nine to five, five days a week for 30 or 40 years. Think about the fact that all that time is not really being used to make you a happier person in a sense. It's not helping you search for your meaning or purpose. It's just doing what you're doing to make money unless you start asking these questions earlier on in your career and then changing what you do at work to better fit your goals. That makes total sense. I think everybody gets an experience and it causes something different in how they look at life. So my mom passed away when I was seven. That set you on a goal to be a doctor. I think I saw a lot of death early in life with different mm -hmm. people. And so I think I understood that life is finite and that people disappear. And even now I'm sitting here in my 50s and I look around at my kids' friends, parents, and I'm shocked at how many of them aren't around. And it's like, whoa, we're only in our 50s. And I'm, I'm, I'm old for my kids' age. In other words, a lot of the other parents are younger for their kids' age than I am because we had kids a little bit later in life. And it's like, it is not as guaranteed as you think. Now, along those same lines, I've already written my eulogy. So I know how to live my life. It fills into that. And I, I think part of that is, is that. And I think that's why you say in the book, dying is easy. What's hard is learning how to live. Yeah, I mean, I think it's true. Like, we all die. It's going to happen no matter what. And believe it or not, the one thing I've learned in hospice is most people die pretty comfortably. So, like, let's take that off. The table is the big worry. Let's start thinking about how we're going to live each moment up to that point. And I say that to my hospice patients all the time. I say, you know, I don't know. You might have a week. You might have a month. You might have three months. I can't change that. Your body's going to do what it does. But how can we make each moment worthwhile in whatever time you have left? And I think it's a good way of looking at things when we're 20 and 30 and 40 and 50, too. Very, very true. So you make a, an interesting analogy in the book. You compare money and oxygen. Can you share that? So this was another quote that I actually got, comes from Jim Dolly. I was interviewing him on my podcast, Earn and Invest. 
And we were kind of talking and, and it was, you know, Vicky Robin was on, Jim Dolly was on, Grant Sabatier was on. We were kind of talking about these kind of upper thoughts that, you know, it really isn't about money and we spend too much time thinking about money. And, and Jim kind of said, well, kind of. He said, money's like oxygen. If you don't have enough, it's pretty much all you can think about. So like, if you don't have enough money and your car's broken down and you don't have, can't get it fixed in order to go to work, to support yourself, to pay the bills, to have heat, to buy your groceries, et cetera, then money is pretty darn important. On the other hand, once you have enough to kind of cover the basics, having more oxygen doesn't do anything, right? So when our bodies have enough oxygen that the heart and the lungs are working well and all the cells are oxygenating and we're doing just fine, you know, having extra oxygen doesn't do anything for you. And it's kind of the same with money. Like once you get to a past a certain level of money, it's not going to solve any of those other problems except not having enough money. And I think that's really what that quote gets to. And, and it, it, it's a dichotomy, right? Depending on where you are on the scale. It's true. We don't worry about breathing. We don't think about, is there enough oxygen in the room? As long as we have enough, right? In the same way, when you have enough money, you're not thinking about it. But part of the problem, I think, is if I live my life in a pool all day, I'd probably start to worry about oxygen much, much more, right? Because I'm constantly underwater. And I think most people, the way they live their life is on the edge with money. And I don't get, and what I mean by that is I'm talking about people who are making three, four, five hundred grand a year still struggling because they live on the edge and they don't give themselves that margin so that they're not always worried about the next time, you know, how long can I hold my breath? And I think this also gets to the point that people are trying to use money to do something that it doesn't really do. So when you see these people who are making three or four or five hundred thousand dollars a year, and they're still living on the margins when it comes to cash, it's because they're trying to buy happiness and it isn't working, right? So they're buying that expensive house or that expensive car or those nice clothes, and it's giving them a brief hit of, you know, that good feeling that comes from buying something. But before they know it, they've got to buy more. And so we all know that reasonably your average person in the United States should do just fine on 70 or $80,000 a year of spending should do great on that. Right. That's a, that's a good amount of spending. Obviously it depends on where you live, but there's almost nowhere in the United States where you really need to spend $500,000 a year. And yet we know millionaires, people who are making millions a year who are still struggling. Again, we've really mistook money for a goal as opposed to a tool. The tool is for us better to reach a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. And unless you're using money to do that, you may find that it doesn't actually buy you what you thought you were going to get. So true. Now, you had a bunch of stories in the book. So let, let's touch on a few of them. We've got the story of Sam, right? He lives full out to the end. He's even got his bag packed at the end. Share a little bit about Sam. So... I had a patient named Sam, and, and remember, I always say this, because of patient confidentiality and privacy, all the stories in the book are a hodgepodge of different stories put together, not to take away from what really happened, but that so no one is identifiable. So you have to understand that the names are changed, everything's changed, and the stories are changed enough that it's safe to put into a book, but the ideas are the same. So Sam was a patient of mine who I diagnosed with a terminal cancer. And he had always dreamed of traveling around the country, but he was always too busy, right? He always had to work. He always had to make money. There was always the kids and then his wife. There's always a reason not to do it. And then he was diagnosed with a terminal illness and we thought he had four to six months left, but he still had a little bit of energy. And so Sam did something unexpected. All of a sudden, he started taking off and going to all these places around the United States that he always wanted to visit. One time I tried to call him and he was at Mardi Gras and I couldn't reach him. Um, when Sam's girlfriend finally came to his house and found him and he wasn't breathing anymore, there was still a bag packed right next to his bed. And it had a, you know, a new suit in it, something he had never worn before. And his good shoes were there. And uh Clearly, Sam was living to the moment he was finally living out that adventure that he always wanted to. Um, 
And it took a death sentence to get him there. And again, that's that's kind of like, how can we become Sam's today <laughs> instead of waiting until we're at that point? I hate to tell everyone, you all have a death sentence. It might not be Sam's of three months or six months, but we all have a time clock and we don't know when the end is going to be. Today, tomorrow, 75 years. Now they're talking about longevity and living to 150. We'll see if it's true or not. <laughs> but the point is, you, you don't get to pick. And you're, we're all on a clock. We just don't know what the, when the clock will stop and when the battery will, will wind down. So you might as well enjoy the journey. Speaking of a journey, you've got the analogy of the three brothers going through life. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that, because I think that gives an idea of how there are different ways to do this and the pluses and minuses of each. So, indeed, I tell a parable in the book about the three brothers, and they're really kind of a way of looking at our careers in general and accumulating wealth. The oldest brother, the middle brother, and the youngest brother, they're each going through kind of their path. In some ways, it's the path of life. The oldest brother is always rushing to get to the end as quick as possible because he wants to get done with his road so he can enjoy life. So he can do whatever he wants at the end, climb the highest mountains, swim in the deepest seas, all those kind of things he dreams about. So the oldest brother puts his head down, works really hard, gets to the end of his path and is exhausted. But at least now he can go enjoy life. Maybe he's a little tired, uh, but then he can finally do what he wants to do. The middle brother thinks a little bit like the older brother, but doesn't have the stamina. So instead, he will grind it out for a little while, make it a bunch of miles down the road, but then get tired and go take a flight of fancy, go off into the woods or climb a mountain, enjoy himself for a little while, and then eventually come back and start again. He gets to the end of his path a little bit later than the eldest brother. So he doesn't have as much time to enjoy that freedom he was looking for, but still has quite a bit. Maybe he has a little more energy. And finally, you have the youngest brother who is totally different from the other two brothers. He loves the path. So instead of rushing through, he walks along, along calmly and enjoys the sights and sounds. It takes him a heck of a long time to get to the end of the path. And when he gets there, he does something that the other two brothers can't seem to understand. He turns around and walks back the way he came. So let's talk about this parable. I like to use it actually when we talk about financial independence because. Once we get our idea of purpose and identity and connections in place, the next step is how do we actually build a financial framework that can support those things we truly want to do that have meaning for us? The parable of the three brothers shows us a few different options of the ways we can go. The eldest brother actually is a lot like those initial financial independence retire early people. Way back in 2008, it was the Great Recession. People were tired of working. They were in these jobs where they were grinding it out. A lot of them were people who are making a decent amount of money. So they said, hmm, how much do I have to work and how much do I have to save so that I can stop working forever because I don't like my job and then live comfortably the rest of my life? So that's kind of like the traditional financial independence route that we've talked about for the last 10, 15 years. But since then, there's really been a change. A lot of the new people interested in financial independence have said, you know what, I don't want to spend all my time grinding it out. They've really started taking the path of the middle brother. So the middle brother more is the passive income or mini retirement pathway, right? So instead of grinding it out, working really hard nine to five for some faceless boss, and then quitting after 20 years with a fat sum in your wallet and in your bank account, Middle brothers will try to create passive income or do side hustles to create enough cash flow every month to pay off their monthly needs. Think about someone who decides to buy a bunch of real estate and eventually can live off the rents. Or maybe they do go for a corporate job, but take mini retirements. So they work three or four years really hard, and then they take a mini retirement for six to eight months, go do something they want. Then they go back to corporate America and they kind of do that until they have enough money. That's kind of a non-traditional but new way of, of heading towards financial independence. And then the last way, which I think is most controversial, is in my opinion, you can become financially independent from day one if you find a job that fulfills your sense of passion, purpose, and identity 
And it makes enough money to pay your monthly bills because why do we want all this financial freedom? We want it to do the things we want. If you're lucky enough to get a job, which is the kind of job you would do, even if you weren't being paid for it, then pretty much you're financially independent from day one. That's the passion play. And that's kind of the youngest brother. And so I think these are the three different ways we can get to financial independence. It's a framework. I look at my own career in a lot of ways. I was the eldest brother because I got to medicine. I didn't love it. I thought I would. I thought I was being the youngest brother and going for the passion play when I went into medicine, but realized I didn't. So I had to put my head down and make as much money as I could so that I was financially independent and I could get out. While putting my head down and trying to make a lot of money, I started acting a little bit like the middle brother by taking on side hustles and buying real estate. So I had some passive income. At the end, when I realized I was financially independent, I got rid of everything at work I didn't like and ended up doing hospice work, work I would do even if people didn't pay me for it. You know, if I had been more in touch with my sense of purpose and identity, if I had followed kind of the rules and the things that were in my book from day one, I probably would have gotten out of medical school, gone into hospice and done it for the rest of my life. And in a sense, I would have been financially independent the moment I started working in hospice because that fulfilled my true sense of purpose and identity. It just took me all these years to get there. So those are kind of the three paths. Do you think you would have known at the young age that hospice was the path for you? I had an inkling. So I always laugh about this. I got into medical school and the first thing I did was sign up to be a hospice volunteer. And my first patient I ever saw was as a hospice volunteer, seeing a patient who was dying in the first week of medical school. So I had an inkling, uh, but I wasn't really listening to myself. So if you look at my life story, it makes sense. My dad died. It left a hole in my life. I eventually would become a hospice volunteer and eventually a hospice doctor and find meaning in helping other people, other family members going through that process that was so painful for me as a child. It makes a lot of sense, but I wasn't in tune enough with who I was at that time. And that is actually okay. That's the one thing I, I wanna like make very clear. I think the paths we take are beautiful and can change. And that's part of the parable of the three brothers is the truth of the matter is life is a lot more messy and complicated and often our paths change and that's okay. The key is not that you stick to one path. The key is that you realize what you're doing and why, and then can make plans based on living your fullest potential. You can always decide later you want to switch paths and that's totally fine. I know plenty of people who thought they were going to be the eldest brother who grounded out for 10 years, got so exhausted, and then they changed paths to a middle or younger brother. Maybe they decided I'm going to go for the passion play. I'm only going to make 50% of what I was making before. So I might not be able to retire, hit financial independence for 10 extra years. But by God, I want to enjoy what I do every day. So this idea is that you don't necessarily and you're not going to necessarily know. The idea is to be thoughtful and think about it and then pivot when you need to. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. You made the assumption that the grind path is short. And I will challenge that because there are a lot of people who will grind it out till their late 60s because it's not enough. Oh, 5 million is not enough. 10 million is not enough. 20 million is not enough. And they keep going because they can't let go and the goalpost keeps changing. So hopefully they wake up and they they see that. No, I'll be honest. I had the same kind of story when I was young. When I was in high school, I was playing with spreadsheets. So these are the first spreadsheets that ever came out. College, I'm working at a bank, helping people with spreadsheets. I just had no idea the value and what I could do. 
And so then I, I went off and I, I, I lived another life. And now I'm back to doing what I love. And I, I don't care about the money because it's fun. And I'm in alignment with what I should have done all those years. I, I think we were a little bit more intentional with our kids. So we'll see uh, how that turns out. It's still early in the game, but my son spent his high school years doing robotics and living that whole thing. And now he's going into that as a, a workplace. So maybe he'll love it. Maybe he won't. Sometimes your passions turn into uh, things you don't enjoy when you do them too much <laughs> or when you have focus on them than with money. Yeah. And I, I want to point to you mentioned something which I think is really important, this idea of we have a lot of trouble defining enough, right? So people make a million, then five million, and they keep working and grinding it out. I think we fall prey to seeing the mirage of wealth as purpose, identity, and connections when it isn't. It, again, it's just a, a tool. So if you don't recognize that, you get into something that I like to call overdrive. Your wheels are spinning, but you're not getting anywhere, right? You're making more and more money because you think money is going to make you happy. You think money is going to make you feel like you have enough, but it never does because you're looking in the wrong place. And that's again, why kind of starting at this idea of purpose, identity and connections is so important so that the, you can then use money for what it was meant for, which is to further those things you're passionate about. So true. And again, that's another thing they don't teach in school. There's one other story that uh, I enjoyed in the book, and that was the story of the old man and his lawn and the kids and how <laughs> he worked that out. So I'd love for you to share that one as well. So we talk a lot about internal and external motivation, and it helps us explain why we do things. So the story of the old man and the lawn and the kids is there was once this old man who had a beautiful lawn and he spent a lot of time thinking about his lawn. It was really important to him, but the bane of his existence was the fact that they were these neighborhood kids who, as much as he loved his lawn, they loved to play football, extend their game over it. And they always ended up running onto and tearing up his lawn. It became the end zone. And so he asked them time and time again to not do it. But of course, then he'd go about working on his backyard or doing something else. He'd come back and they had been there, torn up his yard and disappeared. So at some point he got really smart because he understood behavioral theory and what drives people to do what they do. He took a different tact. He went out to the kids and said, you know, don't, don't run away. Like, actually I've decided that you playing on my lawn is good for it. It helps the grass grow better. I'm going to pay you $10 a week. All you have to do is keep playing on my lawn. And therefore I'll give you that $10. You'll be happy. I'll be happy. Everyone will be happy. So he did it for a week and the kids were overjoyed. They had $10 enough to go buy candy, do whatever they wanted. But after a week, he started getting smart. He turned the screws on them. He looked at them and he said, you know what? I don't think you're doing as good of a job as I was hoping you would. I'll still pay you to, you know, play on the lawn, but I'm only going to play you $5 now instead of 10. Now the kids were kind of annoyed. They were used to this $10. They were happy with it. They felt like they were being rebuked, but $5 is better than nothing. So they took the $5 and for the next week they played on the lawn. So finally the old guy came back to them and he said, you know what? I'm really unhappy with the state of things. My lawn isn't doing any better. I'm not going to pay you at all. You can go play on the lawn if you want, but you're not going to get any more of my money. The kids got downright pissed off. They stomped their feet. They walked away and then they never played on his lawn again. So why is this story important? Well, it, it talks a little bit about intrinsic motivation, right? What truly motivates us? And there have been plenty of studies that find that being given monetary rewards for what intrinsically motivates you actually causes you to be less intrinsically motivated to do things. And so the kids, once they had this reward placed in front of their face to do something they already intrinsically wanted to do, and then it was removed, it actually had the opposite effect. And the reason why I tell this story, I think, is it has a lot to do with what the role money plays in our lives. Like, we use money to motivate us to go to work and do things, 
But in the end, I think it decreases our enjoyment of those things we do at work. We have to stop looking at motive money as the motivation for doing what we want to do. Like we have to start thinking about what we want to do because it intrinsically pleases us and then build the life, the financial life around us that will support that. And I think that's just the point of the story. It's a, a fun story and it's cute, um, but it gets the idea behind that, that what actually motivates us is not usually external rewards, it's internal rewards. And that's why we have to start internally facing and thinking about what we truly want out of life. So true. And it comes, this all comes back to the same thing, right? Thinking. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it's, it's funny because it's both complicated and not so complicated. It's just really comes down to, you know, I, I tell people, you know, when I look at my book, it's really, there are three parts to it. The first is start trying to figure out what enough means to you separate from money and think more about purpose, identity, and connections. The second part of the book is, okay, now you know what's important to you. How do we build a financial framework that allows us to do those things? And then the real last question that relates to the first two is, do you think you are going to die early and not enjoy yourself enough? Or do you worry that you're going to die when you're old and run out of money? And the reason why that's a really important question is depending on how you answer that question, it's going to change how you actually start building your financial independence framework. If you're afraid that you're going to die early and never be able to enjoy yourself, then I actually tell people don't save as much. Like instead of saving 30 or 40%, instead of being the eldest brother and grinding away and trying to get to financial independence as fast as possible, save 10%, still build the financial independence framework, still invest, still, you know, plan a little bit towards retirement. But take that extra 20 or 30% and live for today. You know, do a little bit of YOLO. You only live once. Enjoy yourself. Like my father, who died at 40, had a lot of stuff he loved to do. He didn't think much about retirement because truth be known, he told my mom, he's like, I have this feeling I'm going to die young. So he didn't worry about saving money. I mean, he had a life insurance policy for us in case something happened to him. But what he really did is he went out and he had a bunch of hobbies and he loved photography and he was learning different languages and he was studying things all the time. He was living life to his fullest. He was spending whatever money he had because he didn't think he had a long trajectory. He was right. He did die young. And so money didn't get in the way of him doing what he wanted to do in life. Let's say he was wrong. If he had still built the financial independence framework and still had been putting away some money, let's say 10 or 15%, Sure, he might not have been able to retire until he was 65 or 70, but you know what? He would have been living life to its fullest all those years because he would have been spending money towards things he wanted to do. Now, me, I'm the exact opposite. I've always been afraid that I'm going to live a long life and not have enough at the end. So for me, I'm not, I wasn't real worried about grinding it out in the beginning. I'm like, I can work crazy hours. I can make a lot of money. I can work nights and weekends because I've got a lot of life left and I want to start putting that money away, investing it, having it compound now. And that way I can retire whenever I want and live out my years without worrying. So that question, am I afraid of dying too soon or am I afraid of living too long and not having enough can help you decide the tempo of how you want to carry out the second part of the book, which is building your financial independence framework. So to me, I think that's, those are kind of the three main points. And it's not A or Z. There, there's a whole lot in between A and Z. You got to turn the dial to, to what suits you best. And at different parts in your life, you can run at different speeds and figure out what, what is best for you. Throughout the book, you talk about the climb. What is the climb all about? So for me, especially, it was really hard for me to decide what really felt purposeful. Like, that's a big part of this book is deciding what your purpose is in life. And I definitely faced the hurdle of being an achievement junkie, right? So for me, part of my professional career was getting to higher and higher places as a physician. It was making more and more money. It was reaching these higher and higher peaks. And every time I'd get to a peak, I'd be happy for a moment, but then I would start looking towards the next one. It might be finances, but it's not just finances, right? It's achievements, it's accolades, it's awards, it's those kind of things. 
So what I really realized is ultimately what true purpose looks like to me, and I think for most humans, is finding something we care about and making consistent progress towards it. And the reason why this is important is we have to learn how to enjoy the climb itself. Like if you're not enjoying what you're doing at the time, that really takes away from your sense of meaning and purpose. And yet we do need that sense of achievement. Like we're making headway, like we're moving forward. Once I removed that idea of the peak itself and took that out of the equation, like it doesn't matter if I get to that place I'm going or if I get close or if I go past it and get to the next place, as long as I'm doing something that feels good, that's meaningful and purposeful for me, and I'm making consistent headway, that's probably the closest that I've ever come to learning true contentedness. You have to enjoy the journey. Because if you don't enjoy the journey, you're not going to enjoy the top of the mountain. And I see it more on the materialistic side. You hear the stories, oh, I bought the fancy house and I got the fancy car and I moved in and I looked out and I realized the guy behind me had a bigger house and the guy (laughs) across the street from me bought a nicer car. And even though you achieved more than you ever imagined in life, there's that letdown. and you just have to enjoy the journey. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think I, that's the key. I think peaks are dangerous in a sense. I've actually found that I'm most happy not when I reach a peak, but when I'm getting closer to it. And I think that's an important, an important lesson. I think actually getting to where you're trying to go is naturally a letdown. The happiness is in making progress. Once you achieve it, it's over. And if you don't have a new goal, And if that goal was your entire identity, you're screwed. So think about it. If you're an Olympic athlete, if you're a man who goes to the moon, like what more is there for you to life after that if that's what you've spent your entire life building? Yeah. Jokingly, I say to my kids all the time, I say, may you never reach your dreams, but get 90% there. And I say that half jokingly, but half truly, because I think, um, you know, We all want to wake up in the morning with that hunger to get to that next step. Um, And that's, that's actually part of, that's the climb. That's part of the beauty and the joy is actually knowing it's within reach, but not quite being there yet. It is. Is there anything else that we should chat about that we haven't to with regards to living and dying and doing it intentionally? You know, I think we've covered a lot of it. Again, I think the idea is intentionality. And I think the idea is first purpose, then economics. And I think if you keep that in mind, uh, you'll find that the way is a lot more clear. That is true. And most people who chase money usually don't get it because they don't have the passion to compete against those who do. And they're doing it just for the money. and. Everyone else can see that, which drives people away, which drives the money away. So it's that constant uh, back and forth. So we always like to get people to take action. What's an action step people can take this week to move a little bit forward? I think one of the most important actions, and this is going to be a strictly financial one, because we've talked a lot about the framework in which we look at our finances, but we also need to understand our finances. I think everyone today, if you want to move forward, take a look at something in your financial life that you don't understand, that you've been putting off, that you've been afraid of tackling, and go and spend an hour or two trying to learn about it right now. Because the one thing I found about finances is the real danger is not understanding and knowing about it. So this, for me, was a big problem with having a financial advisor. I think financial advisors are great. But my problem is I relied on a financial advisor so much that I never learned anything myself. I just always did what my financial advisor said without questioning it. So I could have kept that financial advisor, but learned a little more. So I, because ultimately I'm responsible for what happens to my money and my time and everything. That doesn't mean that I don't need help and advice, but it means that I have to be a participant in the conversation. So I think that's a big What I suggest to people is you need to become a participant and stop being afraid to learn new things, especially when it comes to your finances. And I'm going to be blunt. If you're talking to a financial advisor, 95% of them are salespeople. So the only thing you're going to learn 
is how a good salesman suckers you out of your money. <laughs> because when I have conversations with these people, they don't understand money. And that's how they can sell you what they sell you because they don't know the truth of what they're doing and they don't understand it themselves. And that's a problem. And if you don't know, well, that is unfortunately your problem. And more and more today, there are so many different financial programs. And, and the more and more you look at them, you're like, this is nuts. This is crazy. Plain old simple works. Just go do simple. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? My secret to living an abundant life is I think I've changed what I think is abundance. Like there was a time in my life where I thought abundance had to do with money. And now as I get older, I realize abundance has to do with a lot of things like time and interests and relationships. So for me, like I'm at this point in life where I can slow down and I don't have to rush places. And my days sometimes feel like they go on forever. Whereas when I was working, they used to just fly by because I was rushing from place to place to place. So it's incredibly abundant to me or feels totally abundant to walk outside in the middle of the day when everyone else is working, take a book and sit, you know, in the park and read for a half an hour. That feels like abundance to me. Whereas you know, I never, I never felt that, you know, it feels also about it, having the time to learn things that interest you, like having the time to go to the internet and say, I've always wondered how that worked. Not because you're going to do anything with it, not because you're going to use it to make money, but because it truly interested you and having the time and the ability to do that, having the brain power, because your brain is not being taken up with a million things from a workplace. You don't have 10 million emails to return, et cetera. So I've just started thinking about abundance in non-monetary ways. And uh, it's made me see that there's just lots of great stuff out there in front of you. Um, and you don't, you don't got to pay for it. It's, it's free. <laughs> if you give me an internet connection, I can get lost for days. <laughs> <laughs> I, and it's literally from one to the next to the next. And I really have to, I have to watch myself because I will, it's my, my book list is long. My stack of things that I need to do is long, and, I, and I've learned that I have to, to balance them all and sequence them and do a better job. And Little that's wealth. Them. And that's wealth, right? It is. I mean, we talk about wealth in monetary terms, but that's wealth. Having something that you could get lost in and enjoy and that it's, and then it's abundant and it's there and there's, you, know, you don't have to go searching for it. I mean, that's, that to me is true wealth. And having the time to do it, which I do. So it's cool. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? Oh my God, there's so many things. Um, I think the, I think one of the most important things that I learned is that perfect is the enemy of good. And we have to forgive ourselves. We have to let ourselves off the hook and we have to realize that getting 70 or 80% of the way there is often good enough. Congratulate yourself, move on to the next thing. And so I've gotten much better at realizing that I may not be in the top 99th percentile of anything, whether that be podcasting or writing or public speaking or whatever it may be, but that being in the top 80 or 75% is good enough and I can enjoy it and it's worthwhile. So I'm a big believer in the 80 20 rule, which means 20% gets you 80% of the results. Which means if I just do 20% times five, I get 400% of the results. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what I do is I won't do it times five. I'll do it times four and I'll be satisfied with 320 because now I still have margin in my life. Yeah. It's all a trade off. Like what's it, you know, often those last five or 10% just aren't worth it. They aren't worth what it needs and takes to get there. And it's taken me until my 40s. To really realize that. So, so true. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Clearly, invest now. If you put your money in the stock market at 18, by the time you're my age, you're going to be very wealthy. Not just wealthy in cash, but wealthy in time and the ability to do whatever you want with yourself. So if you're 18, this is the time to start putting money in the stock market. 
It very much is. I think I started my kids at about 14 or 15 with Roth IRA, so they'd never even have to pay taxes on their growth. They just got to keep it and love it, and it all worked out well for them. So we'll see how that uh, that plays out. If people would like to learn more about you, the book, what's the best way, or your podcast, what's the best way for them to do that? There's probably two easy ways. One is to go to my personal website. That's jordangrummet.com. J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. You can find out everything about me, about the book. It's a good portal to go to all my other spaces like my blog and my podcast, et cetera. The podcast website is earnandinvest.com. Again, that's earnandinvest.com. I am on all sorts of social media platforms, et cetera, but you can find them all at those two websites. It's probably the easiest way to jump in. And I will put um, links to all of that in the show notes to make it easy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was a wonderful conversation. Do you live a life of regrets? Take the time to plan out what you want and decide and then go do it. I offer all my business clients the ability to walk through and plan out what they truly want from life. I've taken young adults through the exercise as well. It's truly empowering. We use the book Living Forward by Michael Hyatt and Daniel Harkavy. It provides you the framework to do this in a simple, easy format. They've taken thousands of people through it. It works. I highly recommend it. I've done it myself. Let's face it, we all get so much time, and many of us think there's more. And as such, we miss out in life. My advice? Don't. This week's action step was to take a look at something in your financial life that you don't understand and go learn about it. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. Most people in the financial world, they don't understand what they're selling you or offering you or the pluses or minuses, or maybe they just won't tell you. So it's up to you to understand this and to look for different sources and double check. And the reality is this is true for every part of life. Keep it learning, keep improving, and don't be scared by these things. Just remember, you don't have to be perfect. Just get a little bit better every day because that's where the joy happens. Our next episode is a perfect se segue. It's Greg Offner, the titled Work Sucks, Now What? Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, would you mind sharing it with your friends or on social media? I would appreciate that. Hmm? More than happy to say thank you. Thank you for listening. Have an abundant week.